and welcome back to Between the Pages. I'm your host, Grace Randolph, and joining me once again is Fred Seibert, who you've seen on the show before to talk about Adventure Time, which you produce. I do produce. It's a, a huge phenomenon. It's a big, a big thing at all the conventions lately. Uh, and you've ha you have a great background. You did, uh, you know, you were first creative director of MTV, Fairly Odd Parents, uh, and then also you started Next New Networks, which was purchased by YouTube and is now kind of like the, their think tank for channels. Absolutely. Right? And now you're bringing adult cartoons to YouTube and the first premiere channel to feature them, right? Absolutely. Tell Cartoon Hangover. I like the title, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> uh, it was uh, named by one of our development executives out in Los Angeles yeah. years and years ago <laughs> as a little segment on our channel, Frederator mm -hmm. channel. And Which was a Next New Networks channel. That it was, was the indeed. First it, was, it was actually the first channel. Mm -hmm. It was the way we launched the company. Um, and it was really the first animation channel on YouTube. Uh, and we decided when we needed a home for new creators that as much stuff happens on television and on YouTube, there wasn't a place for the kind of people we love to work with, which is great visionary talent who had a view of the kinds of films they wanted to make that wouldn't necessarily fit in anywhere else in particular. We love Adult Swim, but they have a very particular kind yes. of comedy that mm -hmm. they do. And we really like what, you know, uh, Comedy Central does, but they have a particular point of view. Well, it's interesting that you bring that up. And also FX has gotten into adult cartoons mm -hmm. very, very successfully with Archer. Yes. Right? So they all have a distinct voice. How would you describe Cartoon Hangover's voice? Funny. <laughs> <laughs> Knock on wood. <laughs> exactly. I mean, that's really what it is, is we're looking for talent who has a vision where they can write great characters, great stories, and really take their cartoons places that the audience hasn't been yet. Well, you know, I mentioned your history with MTV, and you were in charge of promos, you know, mm -hmm. those famous promos that everybody enjoys. Mm -hmm. And the, your cartoon work, I think, your animation work going forward, echoes that kind of vibe and feel. Mm -hmm. So uh, is that what you're looking for uh, with Cartoon Hangover? We're always looking for people who are looking around corners around for the future rather than... How do you find pe those people? Well, you know, <laughs> <laughs> pretty much they find us, to be honest with you. We've yeah. been doing this for 20 years, and one thing that we're really known for is talent with a voice. We aren't trying to copy what other people do. We're trying to figure out people who are thinking about the next thing to do all the time. And, you know, by the way, we fail as often as, you know, people do. But we're always willing to give that voice to people when, I think I told on the last episode that I uh, was on, that when Adventure Time first came to me, my first reaction wasn't to do it. I yeah. didn't want to do it, right? Yeah. Because it wasn't really echoed what I already knew to be successful out there. Luckily, I had a team around me of people who said, no, this is exactly what we look for, is the future. This guy really defines a humor and a character and a storytelling that has nothing to do with what has happened in the past and really is thinking ahead. Well, you really did hit the mother load with Pendleton. Pendleton Ward, he's the creator of Adventure Time. Absolutely. And uh, we also did another interview with him at San Diego. We sat in on their press day for mm -hmm. Adventure Time. But he also has brought a new show, his first new show since Adventure Time to Cartoon Hangover. Yes. And it's Bravest Warriors. Yes. Right? So, cause you, so you're looking for new talent, but you have two shows on there already. And right. One of them is Bravest Warriors. Yes. So why don't you set that up for us? So Bravest Warriors was created actually in the same year that Adventure Time was. Oh, really? Yeah. It's four teenage superheroes in space. Um, the difference between them and many others is they actually have relationships with each other. Yes. Right? Yes, there's a lot of flirting in Bravest there's Warriors. There's a lot I, of flirting. I remember picking up the first issue being like, and being like, what's, who is this for? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, just like you, Pend Pendleton has a great team. Mm -hmm. You know, a great team of people. We met them in San Diego. Yes. And some of them are voicing characters. Yes. Right? Yeah, so, yeah. So wh whose idea was that? Because a lot of times people are like, no, we, like in Hollywood in particular, they're like, oh, when, once you get into a category, you can't leave. Yeah, you know, our view is that we uh, try to work really hard with the creators to give them as much of their vision as is possible. And when we sell their stuff to a network, we fight tooth and nail to retain that vision for that creator mm -hmm. so that they can do the things they want to do. And often, because it is a show where the artists actually write the show themselves, when they are pitching their characters uh, within the room to the other artists that are on the crew, they're doing it in voice and oh, in character. Like the Disney way that he made fans, a right? Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And often that ends up being, you know, I, I, I will tell you that Penn's uh, 
lasting concern about Adventure Time is that a character he tossed off as a one-off, you know, with a few lines, Lumpy Spanx Princess, has become one of the most popular characters and he's stuck doing the voice forever. It drives him crazy because he really just meant it as a toss off and now it's one of the most popular characters and people are just constantly clamoring well, for it. Well, you never know what's gonna hit, right? Mm -hmm. But Bravest Warriors has hit and I think it's hit big. Yes, it has really been. We're at millions of viewers around the world that's only cool. within, I think, four weeks. Well, that's very impressive. And for anyone mm -hmm. who follows YouTube stats, that's hard to do for a new YouTube oh, channel. It's huge. I mean, so it's really difficult. I was so scared when we launched the channel, <laughs> that nobody would be there, you know? Well, it's a, getting to be a very crowded space, mm -hmm. right? So whenever I go to comic book conventions, you know, Adventure Time fans are legion. You know, they're yeah. at every panel, they're at the boom panels. Mm -hmm. uh, so how did you get them, how, how have you been getting the word out so far about Cartoon Hangover? Well, you know, one of the good things is that we have been on Tumblr with Adventure Time since 2005, oh, believe wow. it or not. Really, we were one of the very first Tumblrs, you know, that was out there. And we have built an audience of our own of 250,000 followers. Plus, we started uh, tumbling Bravest Warriors, I would say, over a year ago, you know, by yes. itself. It's, you've been really, this has been really like a grassroots thing. Absolutely. Because the comic book came out even before the episode. Exactly. Right? When we started tumble logging Bravest Warrior, I mean, uh, Adventure Time, sorry, we didn't even have a first short yet. You know, we were letting people know what was coming on Adventure do Time. Do you find that helps to kind of do that? Because some people like to play it close to the vest. They're like, I don't want to give away my stuff. I, I think that's really old Hollywood. You know, I think that's really like an old fashioned view. Everything's out there in the world anyway. That's true. Whether you want it to be out there or not, stuff gets out there in the world. So we like to be our own news source. We like to <laughs> let people know really early what's going on. Well, fans and are always hungry for new news. Totally. Right? We, we also found that, you know, with Adventure Time, I don't think our Tumblr had 5,000 followers before we launched the show, but you know, those 5,000 followers were already so engaged with the show that we had 500 pieces of fan art before we even went on the air. Wow. So those people are dedicated people and like, why should we do anything but let them help us? I mean, they're, they're fun to be with. Interestingly, just so we're really clear about it, Penn does not run Bravest Warriors day to day. That's a good point. And he doesn't, you know, there's also an Adventure Time comic, which somebody else runs. And this yes. is, you bring in indie talent, which yeah. is very nice, because people usually don't trust indie talent yes. with big brands. Right. So who did you get to run Bravest Warriors? Uh, there's a guy called Brian Burns, mm -hmm. who ironically or coincidentally or um, funnily is Penn's roommate. Oh, really? Um, though when we hired him, we didn't know he was Penn's roommate. Um, was that intentional on Penn's part? He's like, I just know this guy. Yeah, kind of. I mean, we went to him and say, who would you trust your show yeah. with? Right, because this is... He did that with the is, comic, too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so uh, he introduced us to Brian. Brian told us what he wanted to do with the show. He actually literally did a formal pitch to us as to what he wanted to do. We fell in love with him and then found out that he was Penn's roommate, which made a lot of people at Cartoon Network very nervous. I can imagine. Right, because <laughs> they thought that Penn was going to be doing, like, nighttime work on Bravest, which, by the way, he hasn't done. Good. You know, yeah. he has really let Brian and our production team well, run with it. That's just nice. Penn trusts. He, he picks someone and he trusts at, them. At, he, he trusts them. Absolutely. By the way, that was hard one for Penn. He had been used to doing every frame of film himself. He, after all, the first short for Adventure Time was pitched 30 days after he got out of college. Wow. Right? He had only worked on films by himself. And even on the first short that we did, he was very reluctant to bring in other collaborators other than one of his buddies, Adam Muto, who's now the creative director of Adventure Time. Uh, he was a little hesitant. He, he didn't know what it was like working with a bigger band. Well, he's lucky he ran into you. Well, so, I'm lucky I ran into him. <laughs> <laughs> so so you, you have this thing, everything's set up. You're, you're doing the comic, you're doing the show. It's doing very well. But you've also have brought another, I would say, even riskier show. That's an understatement. Yes, super f***ers. Super f***ers by James Kachalka. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of bleeping um, today on the yeah. show. And you bleep it out, but you bleep it in the one channel you don't bleep it. If people yeah, well, like to hear their swear words. Well, you know, <laughs> the truth is, is that when we first read Super f***ers, um, aside from the title, these kids, remember uh, the, what the setup is, is it's another bunch of teenage superheroes. Yes. In this case, they're not doing anything super. They happen to live in a house together, mm -hmm. like kind of like the real world. 
and they would rather drink and smoke and you know yell at each other than do anything super. I, I barely know what any of their superpowers actually are. <laughs> but they have the um, costumes and the names, yeah, exactly. right? Exactly. And they talk the way that um, my friends and I talked when we were living together in college, which is every other word is a swear word. Yeah. And aside from the fact that James is an incredible writer and an incredible humorist. And it started as a comic. It, has, it was a comic, I think it came out five, six years mm -hmm. ago the on Top, top Shelf, shelf yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, one of the great alternative comic companies of our yeah. time. They're, Alan Moore went there. Yeah. Yeah, Alan Moore, but they do blankets, you know, among other things. They do James American Elf, which is now in its fourth volume in 10 years, you know, and has been really successful for James and for Top Shelf. Uh, and they put it out a few years ago, and by the way, just like the challenges that we all are running into with something called Super yeah. there's only so much distribution well, that something like that. Do you think you could like do that. a show like Super anywhere but, you know, YouTube? You know, honestly, we uh, started the project as a feature film. Oh, really? Uh, and then we brought it to television, and in fact, we found interest in television. And to be quite honest with you, I just got bored with the process. I've been doing it maybe for too long, mm -hmm. which is they started saying, well, what are their superhero powers? And I go, well, you know, we really don't know. And they said, well, can we call James? This has been a meeting without James. And I said, well, he doesn't know either. And they went, he doesn't? Oh, no. Don't you need to know? I go, well, why do you need to know? That has nothing to do with their characters or their stories. Well, this is interesting to me because mm -hmm. I'm very, I'm always like fascinated by the mindset of the studio executive because yeah. they're the gatekeepers, sure. and, you know, in the t network. So, would you say because you worked in these big systems? Yeah. You know, you worked MTV, Nickelodeon. You know, did it, yeah. helped with the, came up with the Nick at Night. Yeah. Um, do you think that your mindset has changed? Do you think that the the machine has changed? Well, I think everything's sort of evolving over the years, and there are years that I'm more patient than other years okay. with the questions. Mm -hmm. Right, and maybe it's because I knew that we were going to be starting this YouTube channel that I became you more impatient. Yeah, you know that's possible. Um, but honestly, what happened to me in that process was they were asking me all these questions, and I was sort of you know patiently answering them, and then I said, "So wait a minute. So what's going to happen here is we're going to make a deal. You're going to have an option on it for a year." We're going to be answering all these useless questions for a year because, uh, by the way, I, I, I don't blame them for asking the questions. Mm -hmm. I might ask the exact same questions. But at the end of the day, the person I was dealing with reported to someone who reported to someone who reported to someone. And in those situations, the odds are at the end of a the year, they're going to go, nah, we don't want to do the series. Well, also, everybody wants to put their personal stamp on something. Well, that's for sure. Kind of, you know, so. I, except for me. <laughs> right? I really don't want to put my personal stamp on anything. I want the creator's stamp. That's why so I'm in this business. what's the chain business. of command at Cartoon Hangover? At Cartoon Hangover, we have a development executive called Eric Homan, mm -hmm. who has sourced all of our shorts and our series since 2005, so for seven years now. He's the one who found Adventure Time, who developed Fanboy and Chum Chum for uh, Nickelodeon, who developed our preschool show, Wow Wow Wubsy. He develops all of our stuff. Um, we have a little production team uh, that includes our, our head producer in Los Angeles, Kevin Coldy, mm -hmm. and our New York producer, Carrie so you're, Miller. You're using the same team that you use for, for everything. everything. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so this because is just we, another a creative outlet for you guys. Yeah, I mean, uh, Eric and I have been together for almost 20 years, Kevin and I for almost 10 years, and Carrie for seven years in our team. We're really a tight team, and we see things eye to eye, you know, more or less, in all the stuff that we do. And basically someone comes in and pitches us. Mm -hmm. It usually goes through Eric first, and he might go through a couple of rounds with people of saying, yes, we like it, and let's you know, bring it upstairs, or no, you know, and then people go through their revisions. And now you've set up a situation where you can get an idea and go, should it be a movie, a television show, or a YouTube show? We've always felt that way, actually. We've always been Well, you can't place. always have felt that way, because YouTube is new. Well, right? it's six years old. I mean, That's you know, we, we had two series in 2008 that we did with a creator called Dan Meth. We did something called the Meth Minute 39, right, which yeah. is still mm -hmm. out on Channel Frederator, and Night Fight, which was the spin-off series of that. So we've actually been producing original series now for almost five years on YouTube. How, do you, how would you say the market's changed? Well, in 2008, when we put out uh, Internet People, the first episode yeah. of the Meth Minute 39, uh, YouTube's complete circulation was 200 million views a day. <laughs> right? It is now 4 billion views a day. Wow. 
So the... But a lot more competition for a slice of the pie. Completely, but, but I'm saying that the basic universe of the possible audience has expanded dramatically. Yeah. In those days, we felt fantastically when we got a million views. Now we're going, you know, can we get to 10 million? Can yeah. we get to 20 million? Which we aren't anywhere near. So these shows are doing, you know, they're off to a great start. But yep. you know, one of the things you said at the beginning was that people can... You're looking for new content. Absolutely. Right? For anywhere. Yeah. So how does someone how does someone reach out to you? Uh, they go to our website, cartoonhangover.com, mm -hmm. and there's a little button that says, pitch us a cartoon oh, or right. something. I don't <laughs> remember great. exactly what it says. Um, and it gives all the FAQs about how it is we think about it, what we're looking for, and it gives Eric Homan's email address, eric <laughs> at frederator.com, yeah. and they can write to him and say, how hey. Many, how many emails does he get? Oh, he gets hundreds of emails every Does week. Does he go through all of them? Or is oh, yeah, yeah, no, we yeah. look at everything. Oh, that's great. We look at, I mean, one of our roles in the world ecosystem is I see everybody who comes to see me, right? I mean, I, I see students every day. I, I get emails literally every day from high schoolers around the world. Like, I remember you know, we used to work in the same office. You had like a revolving door of people coming exactly, in. Exactly, yeah. and I'm, and Eric's the same way. We're really open to everybody. We think as a small independent production company in the world, our advantage is we never know who's going to have the next Adventure Time. Uh, and you're willing to take time to look for them, whereas completely. the studio will wait for someone else to find them it, it, exactly and then right. go and take them. Exactly right? right. Yeah. Exactly right. In fact, we have a deal at Sony Pictures Animation, as you know, and one I can't figure out why they want to be in business with me because <laughs> I'm really the anti-studio guy. Yeah. Everything that they want us to do, I don't want to do. You know, I don't like the way they do it. They're mad at me. I'm mad at them. You know, all that type of stuff. But they said to me the other day, "Look, you are the reason that Gendy Kartakovsky uh, directed Hotel Transylvania." Yeah. Because Gendy was one of my shorts makers in 1995. Yeah. Did Dexter's Laboratory. He's, now it's a huge hit. Yeah. He's a big movie director. Because for 20 years, he is one of the guys that I look to as one of the special ones. And when they were looking for the sixth director of Hotel Transylvania, <laughs> yeah. I said, give this guy a shot. You will not regret you it. You put that together? Oh, yeah. That's, a, that's awesome. Yeah, it's fantastic. Well, thank you. I love that movie. Excellent. And <laughs> okay. I love Gendy, so everything works out that's really perfect. well. perfect. Uh -huh. I need to make that connection. All yeah. right, so last question, all right? Everything, Bravest Warriors, this is issue number three. Yep. Uh, Bravest Warriors is from Boom. Uh, Adventure Time is from Boom. There's also a Fiona and Cake miniseries coming Just from Boom. Just came out. Yeah. A Marceline yeah. miniseries mm -hmm. coming from Boom for Adventure Time and also. And is on Top Shelf. Top Shelf. Do you, why do you have a comic book for your properties? Uh, you know, a lot of times that's a choice that a lot of people don't tend to make. I mean, do you really feel it's important to the brand or is it something they came to you and you were like, why not? You know, honestly, we are... Um, at Frederator Studios Cartoon Hangover, we're a passion play. Mm -hmm. We're about people who are in love. We look, uh, I don't know anything about story, and I barely know anything about characters, right? What, what <laughs> You're so self-effacing. <laughs> well, what I look at when somebody is pitching me is at the end of the pitch, am I in love? Am I in mm -hmm. love with a character? Am I in love with the creator? Yeah. You know, how can I bring them closer? And the thing about comic books is it is completely a labor of love among the artists, the writers, the studio, and most importantly, the fans. So this is like when you started the Tumblr. Exactly right. Right? Yep. We know that the people who read these comics are going to be in love. We're in our third printing of the first issue of Bravest Warriors already. That's fantastic. That's a great signal to us of a great passion that's out there. We know we've made a right decision at that point. So why wouldn't we want to make our fans even happier? And if more comics make them happier, and Boom is a fantastic partner for us, and they want to make them happier, like, we're in.